Mm, thank you very much. And of course, uh, I can't say how much of a privilege this is uh, to deliver the first oration of the Yoshio Ogi Ogihara Lectureship. Um, it, it was a very difficult thing to decide what, how, and what topics to choose, so I decided to sample a bit of the research I had done in the past. But before we go there, I would like to say a little bit about Professor Yoshio Ogihara for a number of very specific uh, purposes. The first is, as uh, Ajay has mentioned, we are now entering into our 25th year. That's, that's a quarter of a century, and that is a respectable number of years for any organization to have existed, especially one such as ours, where it actually borrows from like-minded people in the region for a specialty, don't forget, which was sort of the unpopular specialty in orthopedics. We were the ones who were doing these things that nobody else wanted to do. And yet somehow we've created this body that's being carried forward together with the sister organizations like MSOS and, and ISOLS. But I would argue that APMSTS in its entire configuration is a very different kind of creature. And I'm very, very proud to be a part of it. Let's talk a little bit about Yoshi Ogihara. Um, last year, I actually uh, visited uh, Mie University, from which Yoshi Ogihara uh, uh, hailed, and I met with the family. I met with uh, uh, Dr. Sudo and the entire team, and I walked through his hospital and saw his entire setup. And it was a very, very uh, humble, yet very impressive setup. I have written the entire, uh, uh, the entire encounter on the website, and you can see the link there, and I strongly encourage you to read about it, because uh, Professor Ogihara was quite a unique character. But let me tell you a little bit about it. The first APMSTS uh, was conducted in Tokyo in July 1995. He actually died at the opening of the APMSTS from gastric cancer, and a lot of people didn't realize that while he was giving his lectures at the pre immediately preceding ISOLs, he was actually having chemotherapy. He literally would, had plugs on. He would give a talk, go back to his room, receive chemotherapy, get, and he brought his team along with him um, to the meeting. And he actually did that three times, went home, and then uh, conducted this meeting. The inception of the lectureship was proposed by uh, Dr. Ajay Puri last year in Singapore uh, that we should recognize this man and recognize where we've been so we know where we're going. And you can read about this here. There I am speaking to his uh, dear colleague, uh, Professor Atsumada Uchida. And over here, you'll see uh, right at the, at the bottom here is uh, Yogiara uh, um, hosting a number of people at his old unit. I also would like to acknowledge a certain Hanuman Bhim Singh, and he came from Jaipur, India, in the 19th century to Singapore, and amazingly, he was the great-great-great-great-grandfather of the first Yogi, uh, Yogyo, Yoshio Ogihara lecturer of APMSTS. Yes, this was my grandfather from six generations ago, and he was from Jaipur. The lecture proper begins. Let's talk a little bit about association and causation. Teleology or finality is a reason or explanation for something in function of its end purpose or goal. You see this in many, many political scenarios. You see this in many, many scientific discussions. But there's a very strange thing when this happens in medicine. You'll remember that in medicine, you'll begin to evolve physiological concept by what a person should do. For example, the heart rate has to go up because we do not actually follow the arguments forward. We look at the endpoint and say, well, this is the reason why it happened. The teleological approach in medicine leads one to accept various inherent contradictory states that nevertheless appear justifiable by the endpoint. And this is essentially something I would like to delve into in some of the areas of research I've done over the uh, last few years. So if you see the comparison over here, what I'm referring to is, for example, if you draw a correlation with ice, between ice cream, uh, uh, ice cream sole and sunglasses sole, you'll see a correlation, but there is no causation. 
So if you learn to identify these patterns in the various kinds of studies that come through, this will help you as well as in conducting your own research. Now, this is a very good example of teleology at its, at its worst. Now, I'm not sure if you remember this, but I'm sure all of us have been taught something or other to some of this extent. Now, if you remember, we used to be told that in ancient times, people were more likely to die from infections and tuberculosis than from cancer. Why? Because there was no proof that there's cancer. Cancer is so rare that surely nobody died of cancer. And, but today, TB is unlikely to kill, but cancer may kill you, and it's much more common in the lung than bone, leading to generally poor support in the field. So one statement like that has resulted in an entire uh, arm of funding and concepts. Question you've got to ask is, is this true or false? Now, what if I suddenly told you that there were, there's actually been an increased discovery of evidence, tumors, uh, of tumors found in the bones of the fossil record? Believe it or not, the rarest of the rare osteosarcomas are some of the only cancers being found in the human fossil record. Now, I've shown you a bunch of cancers here. These are, these are various bone cancers, but right down here, over here, it's actually an osteosarcoma in the jaw bone of a man a million years ago. Now, suddenly, if this kind of research and these kinds of funding, uh, findings came out, suddenly, well, osteosarcoma is very common, isn't it? And therefore, somehow, we used to have a lot of osteosarcomas, and now we don't. And this is the problem with a lot of the way that we think in historical terms. So over the years, of course, I've had a bunch of uh, uh, areas of interest as far as research goes. But the, the four areas which I've highlighted here are some of the areas where I felt that these uh, thought processes in teleology uh, pervaded the general thinking, and it resulted in um, uh, these four studies that uh, came up with a slightly different slant on what was accepted. Let's talk about central necrosis. Now, this term central necrosis came about um, in various pathological texts uh, circa 1950s. The idea here is that you have a tumor, it's growing so fast, and it outstrips its blood supply, and therefore it must die. Hey, wait a minute. So you're saying there is this tumor, it has it has contact inhibition, or it's lost its contact inhibition. It's able to grow on itself. It's growing and growing and growing, and it grows so fast that it dies. I say it to you like this, and you'll be going, hey, wait a minute. When you put it that way, maybe that's not central necrosis. And that always bugged me when I was a medical student. I went on to work with Dr. John Healy, as many of you know, and he had a and he had this study going where he was looking at pressure differentials in tumor. And he actually found that a lot of these tumors had very high pressure within these tumors. And of course, that's its own uh, area of research. One of the first tumors I ever resected uh, in my fellowship uh, was actually a four-year-old person. Um, and she had an osteosarcoma in, a, in the distal radius, uh, terrible. Uh, surgery, I ended up doing a four-quarter amputation, uh, and it sounds terrible, doesn't it? But actually, that four-quarter amputation was done for a dog. So the dog, actually, uh, we did a bunch of these studies where we would harvest these tumors from dogs, and we would look at them uh, through um, uh, clarification and, and necrosis assessment. Now, the first thing that you've got to understand is this is what would be described as central necrosis. That would be described as central necrosis. But there's something obviously wrong here, isn't it? It's not central. So clearly this idea that's been bandied around central necrosis, central necrosis, central necrosis, is not central. And when you look in the corner, in, into the core of these things, they're very hyperemic, they're very reactive, but they're often not necrotic. So what exactly is going on? So we took the high pressure scenario and we looked at a, a, a model in relation to blood vessels. Now if you follow the high pressure uh, argument, then 
A blood vessel, a blood vessel runs through the tumor. It is by nature leaky in tumors. This results in the leak of protein molecules into the, into the, the interstices of the tumor mass, which naturally would draw fluid up, out and cause these areas to, to have sort of a compartment pressure. And in theory, this results in a compartment syndrome and this so-called central necrosis. There's a problem with that. Because if the vessels really are leaky, then you should have equilibration of, of pressure differentials across the vessel. You can't have it just going one way just to suit your argument. And in fact, that's what actually happens. So then, now you have a problem. How do you explain necrosis? Well, it's been found by Boscher and Helmlinger uh, that what is actually happen, happening is the, the tumor masses actually create uh, pressure spheroids, and these pressure spheroids will bunch up and squeeze up against a vessel and essentially cause an infarct of the tumor. And so this so-called central necrosis has got nothing to do with stripping of blood vessels. It's actually a heart attack. It's actually a tumor attack. It's actually a tumor dying because its blood vessel just got blocked. So then what does the pressure do? Well, we created this, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this is an early version of the bioreactor, and it resulted in uh, us assessing the, the function of these cells under a pressurized environment, which... And it wasn't... This, this, this little uh, video, video micrograph was something that I sat in the lab uh, over a weekend, every six hours going there and taking a photograph, and it looks very humble, but the, the prob the, it proved once and for all that these cells were actually very much alive. I went on to show that actually this, this act of pressurization results in increased proliferation. So it isn't that the, the, the pressure somehow suppresses these cells. These, this pressure actually brings these cells up to a higher proliter proliferative state. And it also has an effect, and I did this uh, work with Dr. Huvos, who, who of course passed, uh, and we looked at vascularity in the tumors. And we were able to draw essentially an idea of what is happening in the microvasculature of these tumors. Essentially what was happening was the tumor proliferation resulted in angiogenesis through the elaboration of VEGF. This resulted in elevated interstitial fluid pressure. The VEGF A would then have an inhibitory effect and the angiogenesis also resulted in VEGFC, which was re, uh, resulted in an aborted lymphatic proliferative state. And that was an attempt to remove the fluid, and there I go teleologically, um, but because there are no lymphatic precursors within that tumor, that doesn't happen. In addition to that, there is also TPA that results in improving uh, angiogenesis in the tumor. And so just by an idea, that was essentially wrong. We spent a lot of resources to come up with this kind of mechanism that sort of made more sense to us. And these are the acknowledgements, and along the way I lost a friend. I'm going to kick this up a notch now to an, another area of research. You will hear this thing being used again. All of us were taught this when we were residents, that the body has a lot of spare parts. It's got skin, it's got the plantaris, it's got the, it has the palmaris, it's got the fibula, it's got iliac crest, and all of these have been regarded as acceptable avenues of donor tissue. But increasingly, and you've seen this uh, in my concerns when I ask many of the questions at these meetings, I'm always getting very worried about medical legal uh, issues uh, in musculoskeletal oncology. Because they are challenging the idea that this is acceptable morbidity. Now this is a diagram, it's a diagram of the development of the fibula across many ancient creatures. These are mostly dinosaurs. And what you will see, that in all this time, you will see regression of various structures in the body. You'll see that in all this time, the tail in the human has gone, uh, the palmaris longus and plantaris has all become vestigial. But when you look at the when you look at the actual historical record of the fibula, 
it's actually remained quite similar. And in fact, it's actually very similar to some of the really big dinosaurs out there. Perhaps we should stop thinking of the fibula as some accessory bone that you can just sort of flip out and put into something else. The vascularized fibula graph is an important tool in reconstructing defects left by resections of various bone tumors. Many of the series out there are dominated by adults, and it's usually due to infections and traumas. So a series that is dependent, that is uh, derived from tumors in children, should be quite unusual. We looked at children who underwent vascularized fibula grafts, and we found that when they are very young and you don't leave enough fibulas, they all ended up with uh, valgus instability in a high proportion of cases. So I decided to look again at this list of uh, uh, patients some years later, and we used the same criteria of uh, when we looked at patient under the age of 14 or who had a short residual fibula, we found that actually this instability had now become a deformity. And this is the list of uh, patients. What we found was that these patients, these children, were actually developing focal lateral tibial epiphyseal atrophy. It wasn't just an instability. They were actually getting mechanical problems. And this is an example of the pattern. So when you look at the pediatric pattern of valgus, they actually get an arrest here, and there's this anterior bowing that develops. You do not get this in adults. In adults, you, you get a dynamic instability where the fibula uh, flips back and forth, the residual fibula uh, flips back and forth. So I would put to you that while this is an acceptable deformity, this may not be an acceptable deformity in the patient's eyes if they knew this was going to happen. In some patients, and in most patients, you'll actually get this neutral uh, uh, ankle where there is no instability. And this, unfortunately, is the kind of case that everyone says and uses as the basis of success in vascularized fibula grafts. So the instability previously evolves into a permanent deformity with age. The mechanical causes cannot slowly, uh, solely explain valgus ankle deformity following vascularized fibula harvest. And secondary changes due to growth arrest in the ankle significantly contribute to this deformity. Adult valgus may be a pre-existing condition and could be mechanical, although if, uh, even this is not conclusive. Now we're going to shift focus into an other area where we're, I'm going to talk about how essentially the, the age-old argument of biological reconstructions versus metallic reconstructions. Now, in metallic reconstructions, the argument has always been that metal can replace bone, to which I would say, oh, really? So this is a slide from uh, Dr. Kotz, and it shows in one of his really early cases where he did a par osteosar uh, osteosarcoma with a custom-made vitalium prosthesis, 41-year survival without revision, highly impressive. The benefits of limb salvage surgery has high functional gain, restored body image, cost preservation, and religious considerations, but these have not been well substantiated in the literature. So I initially saw this uh, statement years ago, and then they decided to do an audit of our patients in the hospital in Singapore. And I stratified these things, and I presented this work in the ISOLs in 2009. I believe Jay Wonder was the chair. And we showed that previously that amputation was not clearly superior to limb salvage, sort of supporting what Sugar Baker had said earlier. And this has subsequently uh, uh, been succeeded by a bunch of other uh, research papers that have uh, supported our uh, conclusions. I went back into these databases and I re-stratified uh, these patients, this time looking at the amount of metal used in these reconstructions because that was a specific area that we were interested in. And, uh, some of you remember Prof. Fo, and he was always interested in this idea that perhaps um, you know, the metal was doing something. And it was interesting. What we found was that across all categories, all metal constructs had the worst physical health scores. And these were only implemented in segmental loss with joint ablations and biological reconstructions scored significantly better than metallic segmentary reconstructions. Of course, there are confounding biases, 
But essentially, this was the, the finding in the large group of cases. When we cross-referenced that with SF36 per se, we found no pattern. But when we drill down in the subtype or the subset analysis of pain and function, this is what we found, that dissatisfaction uh, seen earlier appeared to correlate best with the presence of pain following reconstruction, both subjectively and functionally. And so, I, this, these were two of my cases that I gleaned from my own database. Uh, I can't remember which is which. But this one is a, yes, so this one is a 14-year-old Indian boy who had a Ewing sarcoma, and this one is an 18-year-old Chinese boy with osteosarcoma. Now I ask you, they essentially had the same kind of tumor, same kind of resection. One had a reconstruction and recycled bone with cryo, uh, cryopreserved uh, bone, a tumor-bearing bone, and the other one had a uh, prosthesis. And guess, and I would like you to guess which patient did better. The hint is there, the biological reconstruction. Now, Prof. Kotz actually worked with Eddie Venden Brandon uh, from How Medica to create the many generations of the GMRS prosthesis. And very early on, these were his uh, list of uh, complications. And what you'll notice is there's loosening infection necrosis, wound healing disturbances, and hematoma. But a lot of us who have done mega prosthesis will tell you the patient has two more things. They've got stiffness and they've got pain. But that never comes out in complications of these kinds of lists. <clears throat> but Prof. Kotz actually identified this very early on, and he spoke of stiffness by a soft tissue sleeve and hemosiderosis and fibrosis. But this is an area of research we seem to have just conveniently just forgotten about. In our center, uh, we, okay, and so this patient, for example, has got Ewing sarcoma. Uh, I, I resected her on New Year's Day 2011, so that's nearly 10 years ago. Um, she had a pathologic fracture back then. You know, actually, Prof. Grimer uh, had written that paper after this case. I wish he had written uh, it before. And we were going to amputate this case, but I felt that this was something I could salvage. And nowadays, when I evaluate these patients, I no longer trust the various functional scores. I'm actually looking at motion capture evaluation. And over the next few years, perhaps I'll be able to share more of such cases. But now, what we're doing is more motion capture in my center. And what I'm discovering now is that, yes, you can do the resections in the hip, but the spillover effects of these metallic implants is now of causing myofibrosis and stiffness in the knee. And that's the cause of the dissatisfaction in this patient. Putting it all together, um, I have now a colleague, uh, Gurpal, uh, who was not uh, able to attend this meeting. And he's looking now at metallosis and tronionosis. And he works with Chris Lohman. Um, in, in uh, Germany, in Hamburg, and they are actually looking at metallosis and tronionosis and what perhaps is happening to these metal implants in relation to soft tissue. And that dialogue needs to be made. And these are all slides from his work. So the observations are that the assessments of equivalence should incorporate joint salvage and materials used as evaluable pa parameters. The limitations of this study was that it's underpowered subgroup analysis and the severity of disease precludes joint salvage in all cases. But our study supports the finding of amputations being as satisfactory as arthrodesis and joint replacement uh, salvage surgery. Joint salvage was superior to all other categories, and the recommendation for limb salvage as a superior modality to amputation remains a relevant argument and compels the development of further joint preservation initiatives. So we went from cellular level we went to single joints, we went to big issues with big joints, and now we're going to talk about demographics. Now, what if I told you that economic factors are more important to cancer survival than genetics? <clears throat> You'll see this pattern in many cancers, and we showed this in our own series, that the improved survival of the Chinese in America have been validated across a number of malignancies. So you'll see it in colorectal, hepatocellular, extremity, soft tissue, NPC, and, and when I started to see this pattern, I thought, hmm, this is interesting. I had a special interest because in Singapore, we have four races, and I wanted to see which of the races were, were doing better, if anything. And so I said, okay, let's look at America. They've got a big developed uh, database. And 
And I found that it's true. Even in osteosarcoma, you'll see that the Chinese in osteosarcoma uh, were doing better than the other races. Now, that's a whole different story because you try to go to America and call someone Chinese, and everyone is going to be upside your head. Say, look, I'm not Chinese. I'm, a, I'm this and I'm that. And I'm, you know. So there's a, there were a lot of classification issues. Uni univariate analysis suggests ethnicity is a, a strong predictor, as I mentioned here. And this, again, was borne out independently on multivariate analysis. So it was quite interesting. And if you look at it, the hazard ratio for being oriental is as high as having a single versus multiple mets. Think about that for a second. Being Chinese in America is as good as having one met one lesion versus metastasis. I want to be Chinese. <clears throat> so we perform a cross-cultural comparison of survival of the Chinese in America with survival of Chinese in Singapore. And what we found was that the survival of the Chinese in Singapore and the survival of the Chinese in the US was the same. Uh -huh. Perhaps the Chinese are some superior creatures. Maybe not. When I cross-reference that with how much money they were making, that was the reason. So essentially, what we were seeing was that the, survivals, uh, the survival, good versus bad, stratified by per capita income and ethnicity, showed that there were far more of uh, patients who were Chinese in the rich and higher uh, and the good uh, income category. So that's what was happening. The, these Chinese were actually having, were exposed essentially to their, through their socioeconomic status to better centers. And in closer inspection of the ethnic confounding bias, a number of uh, factors were covariate with being American Chinese. They were clustered around reporting centers with better results. They were treated in later, later decades. So these are not the, not the first generation Chinese in the US. These are the later generation, the more affluent ones. They had more limb salvage, and they had smaller tumors. The, the, the composite picture of something like that tells you that these people were getting care earlier. So in conclusion, a nationwide database on osteosarcoma survival must account for the socioeconomic status. It's not something you hear very often, but we need to account for things outside what we normally discuss here uh, in, in the typical uh, forums like this. <clears throat> and if possible, ethnicity also uh, should be discussed. I'll conclude now with this statement from Descartes. If you would be a real uh, seeker of the truth, it is necessary that at least once in your life you doubt as far as possible all things. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Um, Nathan. I think uh, this is, since this is the first oration for Professor um, Okihara oration, uh, on behalf of the uh, APMSTS, we would love to um, uh, give you the uh, memorial plaque of being the first oration. <laughs> <laughs>